from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy. Oh, his timing every single time with that guitar leg. That's actually today's guest. Yes, uh, it is. Johnny Guitar Gilbert <laughs> uh, on the axe, welcoming all of you to another edition of Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. Well, most things happening in the world of Jeopardy, the things happening that I'm willing to tell you about, Sarah. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm Michael Davies. Those I'm joined things. today by producer Sarah Foss, who knows almost everything there is to know about Jeopardy, but not everything. Yes, and my mom listened to the podcast last week, Michael, and she said, now, why wouldn't Michael share everything with you? And I said, oh, no, I'm sure it's just him being funny. I mean, as you know my nature, now I know how much <laughs> that has changed affected you and your mother mm-hmm. yes. um i'm going to invent lots of new things that i don't tell you great and alexa uh, producer alexa producer carlos i'll tell you about it all later <laughs> on so that you know so it's only sarah in this room who won't know about this what's is going great on. this is all going well well you yeah. mentioned johnny gilbert yes he'll be joining us on the podcast later because of course on friday's show we celebrated our 9,000th episode johnny gilbert a huge part of that so we wanted to talk about it all with him and his enduring legacy on the show Also last week, Michael, we talked about our upcoming Hudson Yards event on April 12th, which we are very excited about. And I actually saw comments. People thought, oh, they're just saying Ken's going to be there. He's not going to really be there. He's going to be there. Yeah, Ken's going to be there. I I, I hope he's going to be there. Ken's going to be there. You're going to be there. I'm going to be there. Matea is going to be there. Madame Modio is going to be there. Katie Nolan is going to be there. Everybody, I think my son thinks he's coming. I haven't broken his heart yet. Yeah, it's a very limited amount of tickets on sale. I don't know if George is going to make the cut. And Ken's actually hosting this interactive game at the event. So you're going to be able to be on your phone and playing Jeopardy with Ken hosting. Of course, we're doing Inside Jeopardy Live for the first time. That's when we're going to welcome Matea and Matt as our special guests because they're about to head into Masters. And Katie (laughs) Nolan, Celebrity Jeopardy finalist, she's going to join us. And then... If you're part of our VIP cocktail event a little later, Austin Rogers mixing up some Jeopardy-themed cocktails. I cannot wait for this event. I wouldn't get your hopes up, I quote, too much on actually playing the game, for instance. It said (laughs) guests will play, but what guests? I imagine the celebrities will be the ones playing. No, yeah, no, no. Everyone everybody's in the entire playing. room can play the game if yeah. they want to. Yeah. Although I did decide I don't think we should let Matea and Matt play, maybe. I don't know. Mm, you know. Yeah. Or do you want to beat a master at the interactive game? Yes, exactly. Game? That may be do. the better thing. That may be a we'll better thing. We'll have to work through that. Of course, tickets are available at edgenyc.com starting March 27th. We only have a limited amount, so... Get your tickets as soon as you can. We can't wait. Yeah, producer Alexa, producer Carlos and I will have a conversation about whether Matea and Matt can play, and we'll uh, we'll let you know closer to the oh, day, thanks. Sarah. I can't wait to see how all things Jeopardy go without my input, but <laughs> you go wild with that. Um, speaking of all things Jeopardy, we just wrapped up the TOC. <laughs> this is even better than I imagined. <laughs> After an epic six-game final, people are calling it the best event on television. Also, interestingly enough, Yogesh Rout, only the second three-game champion to ever win the TOC, last time back in 2006 with Michael Falk. Of course, in the past, it's been based on how many people we have in the field, whether three-game champions got in or not, so that was a little less likely, but obviously Yogesh in good company with Michael Falk. We shared our exclusive interview, Michael, right after Yogesh's win. It's on YouTube. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, I really loved it. Right in that moment, after Yogesh won, you know, seeing how he was feeling and reacting to knowing that he was going to be maybe a Wikipedia article. Yeah, and I encourage all of you to check out the article that Yogesh wrote uh, on JBuzz. Uh, really superb stuff. Uh, really opened my eyes to a, a, a lot of the ways that that he approaches the game and also, you know, the way his mind works and why he's so good at this program. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes from that article, success at quizzing isn't about having a superior innate memory. It's about making the world memorable by investing it with meaning. So much brilliance ultimately comes down to creativity. Um, I think that across all of the arts and sciences and also across quizzing and Jeopardy. And we can share, Michael, Yogesh has officially accepted his invitation to Masters. He has, and we are delighted to have him. Yes, and only two more spots remain, of course, our winner of JIT and our wildcard producer pick. 
We mentioned JIT. It has kicked off. We've played our first three quarterfinals. We'll certainly be discussing those and more on that 9,000th episode. Lots to discuss. But as always, let's take a look back at this week in Jeopardy! history. These three people will compete for cash prizes today on Jeopardy! Jeopardy, Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a brand new show called Jeopardy. This is a very unusual question and answer show. You see, we give the contestants the answers, and all they have to do is come up with the questions. Whoever wins the most money today becomes our champion and returns to play again tomorrow. On March 30th, 1964, Jeopardy! made its television debut on NBC at 11.30 a.m., hosted by Art Fleming. It was on that day that Mary Eubanks made history as the first ever Jeopardy! champion when she took home $345. We spoke with Mary back in 2022, and she told us that she had actually just finished taping The Price is Right when she headed over to audition to be on this, this new game show called Jeopardy! Of course, not knowing what Jeopardy! would become. That daytime version on NBC ran until 1975, and then the current syndicated program debuted in 1984 with Alex Trebek as host. And now, 9,000 plus episodes later, Michael, we continue to celebrate that milestone birthday with Jeopardy. And keeping with the tradition, you will once again be able to take the Anytime Test on March 30th, our birthday, even if you've already taken it once this year. And for each of the first 10,000 test takers, we will contribute $6 to the Alex Trebek Fund at Stand Up to Cancer in honor of Jeopardy's 60th birthday. Yeah, amazing. 60 years ago this March 30th. Uh, also a very significant day for Tracy Chapman, uh, born on the same day as Jeopardy, March 30th, 1964. Uh, all of this kicks off our diamond celebration. So many aspects of that. So many things uh, happening throughout the year. Just really looking forward to celebrating this incredible milestone with all of you. And also never failing to forget... Merv and Julian Griffin, who created this program 60 years ago. That's really important to me personally. It's really important to everybody uh, over here at Jeopardy. Just an incredible job. You know, had that pilot, had that first episode not been that good, we would not be around today. And obviously everyone uh, that has come since, the enormous contribution uh, of Alex Trebek to this program, the enormous contribution of former executive producer Harry Friedman, former uh, you know, elite writers, producers who've worked on this program, um, and the contributions of today's guest, Johnny Guitar Gilbert, who we'll be speaking to later. Well, lots to reflect on, but right now we're looking back at the last week of shows. We kicked off the week with Game 5 of the finals with Yogesh and Troy battling to keep Ben from earning that all-important third win. Yogesh got off to a good start and remained in control for most of the game. Troy doubled up on the first daily double and double jeopardy to close the gap on Yogesh, but Yogesh boldly went all in on the last daily double, $15,200, widening his lead. From there, he cruised into an impressive runaway win, extending the finals for at least one more day. Have to talk about some stats from this game, Michael. Yogesh finishing the double jeopardy round with an impressive $38,800 our second highest final score entering final behind only his competitor, Troy, who had that impressive game to run away with $46,800. This was the game, Michael, where the earth shook. Yeah, literally the <laughs> earth shook. Not that I believe that you or I nope. ever ever felt it. Um, and I can't remember what it was, but we, we, we stopped tape. We ran backstage into into control and into tape and we had to look at something from an adjudication point of mm -hmm. view we listened closely in the tape room to what went on we made a decision we walked back in onto the stage in order to go and speak to the contestants i remember there being a little bit of consternation yes. but i thought it was because we were returning yes. with a judgment with a ruling back with our and ruling. Uh, it so happened that there was a, a fairly high magnitude earthquake that took place right at that moment Yes, this was also the show that our social and digital team shared a bit of a clip from Elvis, you know, the first 90 seconds of this game, yeah. and fans were loving it. Yeah, do you know what? I, I think I mentioned this before. Um, 
that you know when the uh, social team first started thinking that they should show some of this Elvis thing, I'd be why would anybody interested in uh, <laughs> seeing any of this? Clearly, I was completely wrong. Uh, you are interested in seeing this. You all have uh, very fantastic alternative ideas for the way we should broadcast this with all of the angles and all of the Elvis and all of the uh, buzzer data. And uh, yeah, one day, one day, one day. And one person commented, this is the kind of watch modes they could probably start a subscription service for. It's like the red zone for nerds. Yeah. (laughs) But what was so cool for everyone to see is just how evenly matched these three finalists were. And it's really when you see the enabling and who gets in and who doesn't on the Elvis that you really can understand firsthand just what a high level of competition these three were playing at. Fans were hoping and rooting for Troy in game six, of course, because they love Troy, but more than anything, they wanted a game seven. They just didn't want this incredible series to end. And in that game six, Yogesh, Troy and Ben Whew, they ended up having what was a very exciting conclusion to the TOC. It was Troy who got out to an early lead once again, steadily building on it, heading into double jeopardy. But Ben had a chance to go from third to first, finding both daily doubles, nearly back to back. With his back against the wall, Ben goes all in on both, gets the first one correct, but misses the second, dropping him down to zero and out of contention. But you got to love him for doing it. It was the right move. Yogesh had a strong finish to the round in hopes of moving into first, but it was Troy who maintained a narrow lead heading into final. Troy and Yogesh both incorrect in final. And that savvy second place wager from Yogesh earns him the come from behind win, $100,000 and a spot in the upcoming Jeopardy Masters in primetime. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing final. What an amazing game six after five just outstanding games before it we still don't have our game seven this was one heck of a game six an amazing uh come from behind victory you know yogesh having been you know blanked early on in this uh in these finals you know came from behind in this game came from behind in the overall final series found himself coming from behind through individual games uh throughout and just brilliant gameplay statistically you know, look, it, it was three outstanding players and Yogesh separated himself at the end. 343 total correct responses from them across these six games. Only 15 total triple stumpers across wow. these games. 48 average buzzer attempts <laughs> per average. player. That's their average. <laughs> wow. Average combined team Coriat per game, $47,500. Um, you know, the highest Coriat is team is only $54,000. <laughs> Yogesh... Average 22 correct responses per game. That is the most of any of the finalists. That's why he ended up winning, um, really. And 22 against this level of competition is just mind-blowing stuff. Ben, 6 for 6 in Final Jeopardy. That really proved to be his biggest strength. Troy found 11 of the 18 available daily doubles, and he was correct on nine of them so that really cashed in for him yogesh only found three daily doubles was correct on all three it wasn't the daily doubles that got him to win this it was his just sheer great gameplay especially deep in the board deep in the round when he really needed it he uh he came through and one stat that i'm sure troy is very familiar with is the fact that he actually led entering final in four of the games but only once was able to, you know, get that win, and that was in a runaway. Final Jeopardy did prove to be Troy's Achilles heel in these finals. Yeah, it was emotional in the studio. It was emotional for Yogesh. It was emotional um, for uh, his fellow players. You know, this was, and we've spoken about it before, it's been spoken about uh, on Reddit and, and throughout our social, um, the, the fraternity, the sorority amongst these players, their support for each other, um, was just outstanding it was phenomenal you could feel it at every moment and there was this there was this moment at the end where you know that happened sort of long after everybody else had left the stage and and yogesh you know amongst his fellow players you know just really letting it sink in and 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 letting frankly their 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 love and respect and admiration for him um and vice versa uh it was it was it was really quite beautiful Yeah, and Yogesh said in our interview that we did with him right after, Troy is absolutely one of the best, if not the best, quizzers in the world and just 
acknowledged the skill level there. Ben went on Reddit after the game to congratulate Yogesh and yeah. said, hooray for Yogesh, so well played. He gave like a billion right responses and three incorrect <laughs> responses during the whole week. When I miss my daily double, the daily double that would have given me the tournament, I could see that Yogesh was sad that I missed it. Yogesh wants people to get it right, and I love that. He's been helpful and generous since we met at the tournament. We'll be ordering a Team Yogesh shirt for Masters. At the same time, I wish Troy could have won too. The tournament showcased both his astounding depth of knowledge and his graciousness as a competitor. Tough luck for him and Yogesh to be in the same TOC. As for me, I am grateful that I got to play Masters level competition for six games and take part in a great TOC final. I had fun. I survived Ike Barinholtz, and I received the best consolation prize ever. Ben Chan does not miss in Final Jeopardy. That, of course, said by Ken Jennings. Yeah. Uh, as I said to both Ben and Troy um, at the end of the game, this will not be the last time we're seeing them uh, on the Alex Trebek stage and uh, can't wait to have them back. Well, as if the grand prize wasn't enough for Yogesh, Amy Schneider, our reigning Tournament of Champions winner up until that moment, was in the studio and she presented Yogesh with his very own champion's belt. Loved that. Congratulations again to Yogesh Rout. Phenomenal gameplay throughout. Looking forward to welcoming him back soon for Jeopardy Masters. Yeah, I can't stop thinking about <laughs> uh, that competition and the level of that competition, of course. Uh, I know, as does Sarah, uh, know the other uh, two competitors at this point who are going to be coming back. We haven't revealed those to you yet because they haven't played out. We don't want the spoilers. But, wow, Masters is just <laughs> going to be phenomenal in especially if this TOC and this JIT which you're <laughs> watching right now is any indication and now a quick word from our sponsor selling a little or a lot Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business from the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point of sale system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. Plus they have the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. What I love about Shopify is how simple they've made it to grow your business. You can manage inventory, track payments, and view real-time insights all in one place. Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash jeopardy, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash jeopardy now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash jeopardy. Now, back to Inside Jeopardy. Well, it is time to talk about our highlights of the highly anticipated Jeopardy Invitational Tournament, The JIT. On Wednesday, we kicked off our first quarterfinal game featuring past champions Dan Pawson, Pam Mueller, and Andrew He. Pam came out swinging in the Jeopardy round with 12 correct responses, forming a strong lead, but Andrew found back-to-back -back daily doubles in Double Jeopardy and in true Andrew He fashion, he went in big on both, gaining a total of $18,600, catapulting him into the lead, which he steadily built on, finishing the round with exactly double Pam's score. Andrew wagered $1 in final and was correct for the win. Yeah, I think Andrew was feeling the pressure. Um, <laughs> yes. Andrew, it's the first time I've ever really seen him nervous at Jeopardy, um, but I could definitely feel that on the stage. I think he was very relieved to get that victory. Yes, and introduced as our stay-at-home dad now. He had a different look, different hairstyle. Yep. This host photo trend has become crazy, and I think Andrew now wins the award for the most hilarious host photo with Ken. If you haven't seen it, it's a it's Photoshop to recreate the viral Real Housewives cat meme, and the responses to this photo were great. Victoria Gross said, Wake up, babe. New best podium picture just dropped, and Whiskey Ginger this cannot be the foresight to make this happen. Just amazing. Javeria Zahir says, the real housewives of Culver City. <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. Let's take a listen to how our jitters were feeling right after this first quarterfinal game. Three very strong players, obviously. 
Pam, in particular, buzzed in on 52 clues. Wow. Actually got in, I think, correctly on one more than Andrew did. But well, he the found the Daily Devils. Yeah. Yeah. Found the Daily Devils. I definitely did not want to uh, play the tiebreaker against you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's what that was about. You uh, thought maybe you were putting the game away with that second Daily Double, but Pam was still within striking distance. Do yeah. you wish you had bet more? I, I think I do double? wish I'd bet, like, you know, a hundred more or something like that. <laughs> but it's really hard to do that math, like, right in the moment. And, I mean, maybe I should just go all in all the time. Who knows? I thought that overlaps category was going to be pretty tough. I told her I missed all tarantula, which Pam got. But then you got tempo dietary, which I thought was very tough. Yeah. Um, I tried to go for that one first because I was like, you know, none of us have any idea what this is going to, or we might have an inkling, but it's probably going to stump us. And, uh, and you still went for the hardest clue? Yeah, I went for the hardest one to neutralize it because I feel <laughs> like, you know, these people on the stage are probably better at that kind of stuff than I am. So. You feel like you're not yeah. a strong wordplay player? Uh, you know, I, I won't reveal. <laughs> <laughs> Did all I'm not, getting, I'm not getting Queen B on spelling B. Let's just say that. Well, not with that attitude, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew's reference, of course, to something that Ken had said during the break about how he plays the New York Times crossword, Connections, which he says is a ripoff of the British quiz show, Only Connect, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> and Spelling Bee. And he has actually achieved the Queen Bee status that Andrew was referring to, the highest possible score in a given puzzle when you found all the possible words in that puzzle. You Queen Bee status, Michael? No, I'm not. I do, uh, I do enjoy... Uh, playing all of the New York Times games and uh, I go through I go through spelling bee phases uh -huh. <laughs> um, I'm good at finding uh, I'm good at finding words that nobody else would have would have thought about um, particularly uh, naughty words I'm quite mm. good at what a skill well moving on to Thursday where Leonard Cooper Jason Zuffranieri and Larissa Kelly battled it out for the second semi-final spot Larissa certainly living up to the high expectations that fans have for her in this competition ending the Jeopardy round with a whopping $12,000 Early in double jeopardy, Jason found the third daily double and went all in for 9,400 to close the gap in on Larissa. But she had a strong finish to the round, maintaining a comfortable lead. Jason did stay in contention, entering final. However, Larissa wagered big and was able to secure the win. Ken once again caught up with our players after this game. Let's take a listen. Larissa, that was a fantastic game. It seemed like there was a little stretch in that game where you kind of lost your buzzer timing for a moment. Is that what happened? And that was where the daily doubles happened to fall? I don't know. I, I mean, Leonard did it. I think you ran the category in the elements, right? Uh, almost, yeah. yeah. I think mm -hmm. at the beginning of the first round, I could not get the buzzer timing right. <laughs> I was just having a lot of trouble, and I got a couple like bad answers. That Boutra's Boutra's answer really hurt me a lot. Um, but then once the second round started, I kind of started changing my timing a little bit, and I got more in the groove and got the buzzer timing a lot better after that. Well, you had two great gets in that round. Uh, you know, you kind of had to dig for that daily double. P, phosphorus, what's oh, yeah, going on? Was, yeah, yeah, it was great. great. And then our writers were particularly impressed by coming up with Timon of Athens ah, yeah. in the nick of time, because for that one, you have to know SB and is antimony, yeah. and then you have to know that Timon is a Shakespeare character. It's kind of tough on two ends, and uh, well done getting there. Thank you. Yeah. And Larissa, I was impressed by, I did not know Lydia Bastianich. Our head writer had been told that this was a hard clue, and he said, no, no, my dad loves Lydia Bastianich. <laughs> and the writer said, Billy, your dad's not playing. <laughs> but luckily, she had another fan in this game. But, uh, you know, I like that you kept the pressure on there, Leonard, yeah. and Jason did the same with the Daily Double. But Larissa, you withstood the pressure, and you're making it to the semis. Congratulations. So fun for me during JIT to meet and, and witness. Um, uh, so many of these great players, you know, legendary players on Jeopardy who, you know, preceded my uh, brief and turbulent tenure uh, <laughs> at the television program. And uh, Larissa, somebody obviously I'd heard so much about. Uh, I know how many fans she had uh, within the production, as did pretty much everybody who came to cheer, frankly. Yeah, good um, And uh, just wonderful watching her play. So Larissa goes from all-star winner to JIT semifinalist, and we closed out the week with our 9,000th episode, where champions Terry O'Shea, Matt Jackson, and Alan Lynn competed in our third quarterfinal. This was the Matt show from the beginning. He quickly formed a strong lead and steadily built on it in double jeopardy. Terry and Alan fought hard, but there was no catching Matt after he found that last daily double, scored an extra $12,000, cruising into a dominant runaway win. This episode was all about Johnny Gilbert. Michael, of course, we had the lyrical stylings of Johnny Gilbert. We love to hear a good Johnny Gilbert clue. And we just so happened to have a few that we weren't able to air. And I thought I'd give you a little quiz. Oh, wonderful. So take it away, Johnny. 
I took a Louisville slugger to both headlights, slashed a hole in all four tires. Maybe next time he'll think before he cheats. Oh, what's her name? I know the song. I can. I can. I took uh, a Louisville slugger to both uh, headlights. What's her a hole name? In all four tires. Was she on American Idol? Yes, yes. she was on American uh-huh. Idol. Yes. Kelly Pickler? Nope. No, the other one. <laughs> Um, um, beep, 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 time's yeah. up. Who uh, is Carrie Underwood? Carrie Underwood. Yeah. Do you know the awful thing is that I read all these clues and approved all of them before they even went there and I still can't remember. All right, here's one for you. You know that it would be untrue. You know that I would be a liar. If I was to say to you, girl, we couldn't get much higher. Oh, listen to that song a thousand times late at night in southeast London after coming home from Chelsea. Uh, that's The Doors. Come on, baby, light my fire. Good job, good job. All right. She's been a bad girl. She's like a chemical. Though you try to stop it, she's like a narcotic. Uh, Like a narcotic. Yeah, it's another one for my era. That's um, that's Elvis Costello. Good job, good job. Talking of Chelsea, by the way. All right, one more. It's the thuggish, ruggish bone. It's the thuggish, ruggish bone. It's the thuggish, ruggish bone. Well, that sounds like Dr. Seuss, but I doubt it is Dr. Seuss. That's going to be some, that's going to be, uh, yep, yeah, don't know. Bone wow. Thugs in Harmony, one of Bone our favorites. Bone Thugs. One of our favorites. All right, let's just take a listen to what goes into one of these recording sessions with Johnny because it is an absolute delight. Okay, this is from Billy Ellish. I'm that bed type, make your mama sad. Oh, I'm that bad type. Make your mama sad type. Make your girlfriend mad type. Might seduce your dad type. (laughs) I'm that bad type. Make your mama sad type. Make your girlfriend mad type. Might seduce your dad type. I'm the bad type. Bad guy. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I'm that bad type. Make your mama sad type. Make your girlfriend mad type. Might seduce your dad type. I'm the bad guy. All right, let's see what we got here. This is by a group called Bones, Thugs, and Harmony. It's the thuggish, ruggish bone. It's the thuggish, ruggish bone. It's the thuggish, ruggish bone. Oh, boy. And then we wrapped up the 9,000th episode by honoring Johnny, of course, the only member of our Jeopardy team who has been a part of all 9,000 episodes. That was pretty special. Please welcome to the stage, Johnny Gilbert. Oh, look at this. That's the cake? You're kidding. Uh, How do you like Jeopardy now? After 40 years, is it a good show? What do you think? Alex and I started the show uh, when Merv Griffin created it, put it into syndication, and it was bought for 13 weeks. And if it didn't do well in 13 weeks, that was the end of the show. Obviously, it's done very well. So for what it's worth, thank you very much from a very humble guy on Jeopardy. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. All right. Well, that wraps up our game highlights. Now on to this week's host chat. An audience member asked Ken, what was your best subject in Jeopardy? I would usually go to movie categories first. I'm a pretty big movie guy. I'm a little bit hard to stump there. Um, I do like all the wordplay stuff. I grew up doing the jumble in the newspaper with my dad, like when he'd get home from work. So I always liked messing with letters, and I did the crossword in the, crossword in the New York Times every day. Uh, my student paper ran it in college, so I didn't have to pay attention in class because I had a a crossword to do. Um, And not all Jeopardy players love the wordplay stuff. Like Brad Rutter, amazing Jeopardy player. Like he would hate it when I went to the wordplay clues first. So, you know, secret weapon. Michael, any hypothetical favorite categories for you as you'll never be able to play Jeopardy? Uh, You know, I'm a big history guy. I'm a big sports guy. And uh, I'm slightly dangerous on world geography. But do not, even though I'm the brother of an opera singer, do not give me the dreaded opera category. Understood. Speaking of sports, I think I sent a clip to you this week of Arthur Chu telling Alex Trebek years ago in the Tournament of Champions that Jeopardy is a sport. I owe it all to Arthur, and I didn't even realize. Perhaps (laughs) subliminally, uh, I was watching that 
tournament of champions i watched jeopardy a lot over the years and that sunk in right there yeah well that was fun to come across it is now time to welcome to the pod the one the only the voice of jeopardy johnny gilbert welcome johnny thank you thank you very much you know you open every show (laughs) playing the theme tune uh, on your axe, on your electric guitar. Oh, boy. Um, so we thank you for that. You're always present from the top of our podcast every single time. We love having you on the pod. Well, we've just celebrated the 9,000th episode of Jeopardy, and along with it, celebrated you, Johnny, the only person who's been a part of all 9,000. How does that feel? Feels like only yesterday. <laughs> Actually, it really doesn't feel like 9,000 shows. That number really boggles my mind uh, that it's been so many. But when you enjoy doing a show so much, as I do and as you know, you don't think about the count or the time or the weeks or anything. It really just goes by so pleasantly. Johnny, what are your memories of that very first episode? Well, Michael, we were uh, in West in Hollywood, as you know. Uh, Merv had set it up at one of the local television stations, uh, using their studios, uh, and uh, Alex and uh, and they hired me to come in, and we did the first shows in a little studio that we shared with another show. So when we finished doing our first shows, they would break down our set, put it away, and put out the other set. Well, most of it was made of neon tubes, and I remember that so clearly, waiting for them to take it down and waiting for them to put it back up so we could do our shows. Uh, we've come quite a way since then, obviously. And did you have any idea, you know, in those first few episodes, that it would go on for 40 years? Well, I think we all had a good feeling about it, uh, Sarah. You know, the, any show that goes into syndication, and that was just beginning, syndication was just coming alive then, uh, and that's why Merv decided to put it into syndication. It had been on the network, and he wanted to try that where it sold to the individual stations all over the country and eventually all over the world. So we knew what the possibilities were, but you never know uh, when you do a show uh, whether it's going to work or not. Of course, with Jeopardy, since it already had a record we felt pretty confident about it and of course Alex was <laughs> so great from the very beginning in doing the show that there were very few flaws in it if the show was going to be bought and be popular that was on and was going to do it you know a lot of actors Johnny and we're all in Hollywood a lot of actors talk about their motivation they uh, whether their method or not they talk about sense memory they talk about what is their inspiration for performing their roles when When you started originating this very unique voice, this very unique opening announce, which is introducing all the contestants, introducing them by their professions, introducing Alex before he walked out, was there anything that you brought to it that was slightly different? Is there anything about your performance that felt different for you from the beginning, from every other show you'd done? Yes, there was, because uh, the opening of the show that I do and have done for so long was such a high-energy intro. Uh, Even though it was a short intro, it was such a high-energy intro, it gave it so much difference. I've done a lot of game shows over the years, as you know, the Pyramid shows, I did all of those, and and so many different shows over the years, that uh, the normal opening of a show is always up and high-rated in a game show, because you want to get people excited. But those... Three words that uh, Merv wrote at the beginning of the show had such emphasis on it that that's what led me to do that the way that I did and the way that it worked. Uh, And I think that was different from anything else that I had done before. And, of course, Alex came out with high energy. At that time, he was really high energy. If you saw any of the earlier shows, you saw that. And I think the combination of his... uh, professionalism because he had done several shows the game shows before that also uh, all added in to making it really a good tight show what was it like to have alex as producer alex you know many of us know him as the host but what was it like you know in those early seasons to have him as the producer as well well you know yes he had the uh, name of producer and certainly he worked at it but Merv was there all of the time uh, and as the exec producer and of course Merv was very verbal uh, and vocal about all kinds of things so uh, that wasn't really what Alex wanted to do I think and as you know he didn't stay in that vein very long before he said no I think I just want to be the host of the show and Merv agreed So it was a different thing, but we were talking to two people instead of one, really. Yeah. Did Merv ever give you any uh, constructive criticism, or did he just think from day one, your This is Jeopardy was right on target? 
Well, he told me that's the way he wanted it done. That was the opening. That was the emphasis that he wanted, and that's the way he wanted the people introduced. And I locked in on that once he told me uh, how he wanted it done, and it stayed that way f- from all the way up till now. Do you have a favorite season or memory or show or place that we traveled to or anything in the 40 years of Jeopardy that really stands out to you as a highlight? Uh, You bring back so many different memories, Sarah, over all of those years when we did a lot of traveling. You're right, we're on the road a lot. And that was really exciting. That was exciting because of the audiences that we had in the various studios and college dorms and places we were working and doing the show were so enthusiastic. They really were. Jeopardy had come to their house, their home. And you could feel that enthusiasm all the time with the people in between shows. I was always out there at my podium because I enjoyed enjoyed it, signing yes. uh, uh, cards and pictures and talking to the people. Uh, that was the enthusiasm. So I always really look forward to those travel shows, really do. And I think you did too when you were traveling. I did, but it was the energy, you know, when we'd have thousands of people packing, you know, an auditorium or a stadium to feel that when you would do the announce and to feel that love right back after you introduced Alex. It was quite something I'll never forget. Well, it was exciting because most of those people, of course, would never be in Hollywood. They would never have a chance to come to the studio and see the show. I think that was the exciting thing about it. And it was really a high spot in their life, which made it a high spot in ours. And traveling all the cities were always so welcome by everybody. Really a wonderful feeling. Johnny, you are uniquely qualified at this point. (laughs) 9,000 shows in, 9,001 as of uh, the time that most people are listening to this podcast. You are uniquely qualified to sense the way that Jeopardy and Jeopardy's audience and the culture of Jeopardy has changed over these past 40-odd years. What do you sense is the biggest change in the program? I think from becoming, as it started out, as just a game show, it became a a place of importance. Things people spend their whole life watching this show, starting out as little children, growing up with the show. Uh, That's an amazing thing to me. We listened to the contestants, and they said, we've watched it. We sat down every night with my mother, my dad, my kid, my brothers, uh, and watched the show. It's not just a game show. I mean, just don't turn on a game show. You turn on Jeopardy. And it makes a big difference in people's lives. And you can hear that when you hear them talk. And the fan mail that I've gotten over the years, and I I refer back to that because I was so pleased and really humbled and amazed by so many letters that I got from people that were, I don't know, uplifted by the show and by the way that I announced it. Uh, That's quite a thing to hear from thousands and thousands of people. Well, of course you know you're beloved by our staff and crew, but I have to think it must be almost overwhelming to know how many millions of people love you and count on your voice every night to let them know that this is Jeopardy. It really is. It's hard to believe. Really, after all these years, it's still hard to believe the amount of people, the size, the depth and uh, of the show and what it reaches to all of the little towns and all the, even overseas uh, get mail from people. So I'm aware of that, that it, uh, you're not, I'm not just introducing another game show. I'm introducing Jeopardy. You know, Johnny, there's a wonderful Canadian writer who uh, we refer a lot to in the show and we read a lot on the show is Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote a book called The Story of Success, Outliers, The Story of Success. (laughs) And in the second chapter, he he talks a lot about the 10,000 hour rule and this idea that to really establish expertise in any field, you simply just have to practice and all by it in the correct way. And probably you need to do it 10,000 times. He says 10,000 hours, <laughs> but I'm going to give you 10,000 half hours. So what I'm really leading to, Johnny, is here is you're still a thousand short or 999 short of of what we really need for you to. You, you're going to get even better by the time we get to 10,000, Johnny. Well, thank you, Michael. Well, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm, I'm almost there. I'm getting to it. I think I'm getting to the heart of the thing. <laughs> Okay, 10,000. Oh, good. wow. Keep plugging away, Johnny. We, we believe in you. We think you can get oh, there. I love you guys, well, as I do yeah. everybody on the show. <laughs> Dating back only to 9,000. That's where we are so far. Let's talk about that special episode. Obviously, we really wanted to honor the milestone for Jeopardy, but really just honor the fact that you've been a part of all of them. 
we had you on stage, and my favorite moment is the cake. You looked at it for a while, and you said, where's the cake, Sarah? (laughs) Talk about naive, huh? Wow. Well, it was all such a surprise to me, Sarah. As you know, I had no inkling uh, what you had set up and what was going to happen. So when I came out, I, like anybody else, expected to see a big cake there with a knife and all of that. And (laughs) I was totally shocked to see the image of myself at my podium uh, and no visible cake at that point. You know, that caught me off guard a little bit. That's for sure. Well, in that episode, we would be remiss if we didn't include one of your wonderful vocal categories. You know, these categories date back to 1999, Johnny, when you first did the Johnny Gilbert Does Shakespeare. It was a hit in 1999. It continues to be a hit 25 years later. Every time either Alex or Ken or whomever introduces one of your categories, this time it was the lyrical stylings of Johnny Gilbert. We played some of the um, recording a little earlier in the podcast, and, you know, you said to me, Sarah, I think I know one of these. And we tested Michael a little bit. He knew a few as well, but we always throw something at you, Johnny, and you always deliver. Well, I try. I try. You know, I don't want to lose my job here, so I'm trying to work hard at it. By the way, 40 years has gone by in a flip. Uh, it doesn't seem like 40 years, and it never will, and that, that's a good sign in itself because I always look to the next opening and to introducing the next people and watching the shows. As you know, I'm there for them. Mm-hmm. Well, we love having you a part of 9,001 of them. Michael's got a new goal for you, but thank you so much for joining us on the pod and sharing a little bit of your incredible, incredible legacy here at Jeopardy. Thank you for having me on the show, and thank you to all the people that listen to my voice. I hope I can do it for at least one more thousand shows. <laughs> oh, Johnny, you're amazing, and what a beautiful voice that is. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Ah. Oh. That man always puts a smile on my face, makes me feel better, puts a spring in my step. Everything is right in the world after speaking to Johnny Gilbert. I couldn't agree more. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. Join us again on Monday for more Jeopardy! Invitational Tournament highlights. And don't forget tickets for the first ever Inside Jeopardy! Live on tour where Ken Jennings, (laughs) Matea, Matamodio and... Katie Nolan and many more will actually be, we promise, uh, they go on sale at 12 p.m. Eastern Time this Wednesday, March 27th at edgenyc.com. That's edgenyc.com. We really hope to see you all there. And we'll see you all next week here on the pod.
For more great Jeopardy videos, hit the subscribe button below.